Today we're going to discuss two lab projects, M9 and M10. M9 is just a little shorty that was too short to throw in as a separate discussion, and it is formalizing the idea of creating a template that you can use for the rest of your programs. And you can use it as a concept uh, as you move on in your career for buffering I.O. And this template is a project where you have a buffer inputs and buffer outputs program file. And in those program files, you're buffering the inputs and the outputs. You may or may not have a sequence program in between those two, but that's where you would put the heart of your programs. And that's what we're going to do from here on out in this course. The remainder of this discussion, and most of it, is going to be M10, where we're introducing the next practical application. We call it a challenge, but it's a practical application, and it's conveyors. So if you think about the garage door opener, that was a process, a sequence that almost anybody on the face of the earth has seen and somewhat understands. Conveyors would probably be the second easiest application to visualize. Everybody can visualize belt conveyors with objects moving on the belts and also adjacent to the belts are photo eyes with optical paths that are perpendicular to the direction of travel of the object so you can detect these objects. So our challenge or our next practical application is a series of conveyors. We want to be able to start and stop these conveyors individually and we also want to be able to have some control over them as a group. So that means that we're going to take the traditional start stop circuit. We're going to use it to start and stop conveyors but we're also going to use it to start and stop the system of conveyors. And then we're going to introduce some a form of error checking or being able to detect certain conditions of the objects on the conveyor that we want to interdict or to interact with. So let's let's get in with this project and get it started. Uh, this is a relatively fun project. I don't know if it's as fun as the garage door, but uh, I certainly like working with conveyors. I've done some uh, <laughs> incredible material handling systems. I won't say the name of the company, but uh, they are in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they have 15 ovens that melt silica sand into glass, and they make glass cups. Now, uh, it's typical to refer to a glass as just something to drink out of that has no handle. Otherwise, it's a cup or a mug. But in reality, if it has no handle, it's still a cup. It's a glass cup, plastic cup. So if I use the term cup, uh, I've only recently adjusted my language to say cup when I, before I said glass. Even though I was referring to a plastic cup, I says, hand me the glass. So this company makes glass cups and mugs. They make those beer mugs that you see at so many pubs. So they melt silica sand into glass and then they mold cups. Well, the material handling system, and bear with me as I describe this, each of the 15 ovens or production areas had molds. And as the products cooled down, but not when they were totally cooled down, they were still really hot, they put them into corrugated cartons. And then these corrugated cartons would go up towards the ceiling on a feed conveyor and then they would go to they would take a turn and go parallel to the main conveyor okay so they went up and went on to uh, a a straight piece of conveyor next to the main conveyor then there was a pusher bar that could push cartons out onto the main conveyor at one time that was called a slug so a slug couldn't be any more than eight or nine feet long so once there were enough cartons of that type, it would push them out as a slug. And then you would have to 
work with a data structure for the conveyor to inject into the virtual conveyor what the product code was for whatever filled up that part of the conveyor. And as it keeps moving, the data had to move with it. And then when you came to the end of a conveyor and the beginning of another conveyor, when the photo eye detected it, it would look to see what that part number was. It would adjust it for a location if it had gotten off track and then would resynchronize it. It would go into the next conveyor and then would go into the virtual data conveyor for that conveyor and on and on and on and on. Then when it got all the way down on the main trunk, then it, they had to sort the different part numbers out onto spurs because they wanted to palletize or unitize. And that means you take cartons of all one product type and you stack them in layers on a pallet. And then you shrink, or not shrink wrap it, but you wrap it. And then that's a unit load. So that meant that you had to track these slugs of cartons on the trunk. And then as they arrived at the sorting area, the photo eye at the entrance would, would say, there's something here and look to see what was closest and say, oh, it must be this part number. So that would go into the data structure for that sorting conveyor. When it got to the right spur, then the diverter would come out and it would push it off onto a spur conveyor and run it down until it blocked the photo eye at the end. And then it would keep, every time that same product showed up, it would divert onto that one spur. And once that spur had enough cartons on there to make a unit load, then it would start up and go on another main trunk line down to unitizer, palletizer. And they're really cool. You can go online and type in palletizer, unitizer, and you can see them in action. Then you can go look at a uh, wrapping machine or unit wrapping, pallet wrapping, and see the whole process. So material handling is, is relatively easy to visualize. That's why we're going to use it uh, quite a bit for the rest of this course. We'll just keep building on this one application. So let's get in there and get started. This is our simulator. And there's several ways that you can go about creating your template. You can create it from scratch based on what I'm going to show you. Or you can open up an older project, say a garage door project, and go in and delete all the logic in the sequence program and then go through and make sure that there are no local variables. Let's open up buffer inputs and look at it. Go to buffer outputs and we have the exact same thing except we're going the other direction. Go into sequence and it's empty. Local variables empty. Local variables empty. Local variables empty. Now here's the key part though. Once you've deleted any logic and sequence, not don't delete. So once you've got this all tidied up, then go to global variables and go to your, your IN zero through five and your OUT zero zero through zero five and make sure there are no aliases. Got to be really careful when you're deleting these aliases. Let me put one back in here. Just some stupid characters. Now, if I go up here, and then select that, even if I double click on it, if I hit delete, uh, it's going to delete the whole tag. You need to go over to the beginning of it and then delete it like you would backspace, so to speak. You know, delete one character at a time and then hit enter. If you just select and you think you've clicked on this variable and you hit delete, your lab will to delete the whole thing. Now you can go back and recreate that tag variable, uh, memory location pointer. You can go recreate it. But just to give you a heads up, because this is just a template. If this were a real program with hundreds of tags, variables, and you deleted one, you might be standing there going, oh, what was that? And you can't even remember what you deleted. Then you'd have to go through your whole program and look for the yellow triangles to see what was missing. And then we saved it with a name template. And actually, this template will work with anything 20, 30, 50, 70. Because remember, I can go in and change the controller to any of these. To So that's your template. 
This is Lab Project M10. This is the conveyor system that we're using for our practical example for CLN logic. We're also going to turn around and do it with latch, unlatch, or set reset logic as well. Let's describe this. You see a gravity conveyor and you see two powered conveyors, belt conveyors. You see two cartons, a large one and a smaller one. You see four optical paths, one, two, three, four PE. 3 and 4 PE aren't in play for this particular project. Just 1 PE and 2 PE, one conveyor, the motor that runs one conveyor. The first conveyor is gravity on rollers, so the cartons roll down and slide up against the leading edge of one conveyor and set there unless the conveyor is running. And if the conveyor is running, then when it hits that leading edge, it gets pulled right onto the conveyor. Now, the mechanical dynamics of the adjustment of these conveyors is such that if the carton is at rest on the leading edge, not quite to 1 PE yet, enough of the carton has to be in contact with the conveyor belt so there's enough friction there to pull it off of the rollers and onto the belt. So there are some mechanical adjustments here, but we're not worried about those. Just assume that if the carton is resting, the leading edge of the carton is resting against the entrance of the conveyor belt, that if the conveyor starts up, it will pull it onto the conveyor. When it comes to objects on a conveyor, we always speak in terms of leading edge and trailing edge. Okay, so we have two sizes of cartons coming from the production area, and they each have their own conveyor system, and we need to detect if any rogue cartons get on the conveyors. In other words, one could go on the floor and somebody could pick it up and throw it on the wrong conveyor section. If an incorrect carton length is detected, we want to stop the conveyor motor, turn on a fault indicator, and wait for the operator to remove the rogue carton. The operator acknowledges the corrective action by pressing the stop button, and then they can restart the conveyor. So they have to remove the rogue carton, press the stop button to reset the fault, and then they can restart the conveyor. This conveyor is for smaller cartons. 1 PE and 2 PE detect carton length. If they are both blocked during the same program scan, it is a large carton. The smaller cartons will block 1 PE and then clear 1 PE before blocking the optical path of 2 PE. Also, we do not want a fault declared unless the cartons are in motion. How might you do that? Well, you just make the state of the motor running or not running as a condition. And the reason that we want to do this is because sometimes people have happy fingers and they think it's cute when they walk by a conveyor to flash their fingers in front of the photo eye. If both optical paths, one and two PE are blocked simultaneously for one program scan, that's basically about 300 microseconds then that's the, the carton's too big. Now, obviously, the adjustment of the space between the optical paths of 1 and 2 PE is very important. And I would say that you, wanna, you, you wouldn't want to put it so tight that if a small carton got in between the two optical paths and then maybe it was skewed a little bit, you know, just turned slightly, not running totally square with the conveyor, that it could trip both at the same time. So there's other considerations, but let's keep this simple. Okay, you saved your previous project to preserve that project, then, then you open your saved template. Remember, we created a template and then save immediately with the name of your choice. Now in the manual, I said, I abbreviated conveyor underscore PX01. Make sure that your template is clean, that there's no aliases and there's no local variables. We start with a template and we add in a rung of logic. There's the first rung of logic. We could save and download this. However, let's add some aliases to make it more readable. To do that, we open the global variables and we want to add our aliases right here. So let's add one. And for input zero, that's our stop push button. Here are all the aliases that we're going to use. There's a reason why that we used input zero for the stop push button and output zero for the size fault. That's because on our field device simulator, output zero zero 
is the LED inside of the push button for input 00. zero. The push button for input and output 0 has a red lens. And that's the only red lens on the field device simulator. If you get a fault, the red light lights up and you push that button that's basically behind the red light to reset it. I'm going to close up some of these tabs. Okay, now this is still M9 template. What would happen right now if I saved this? Not a save as, but a save. I would have boogered up my M9 template. Before I get too much further, I need to save project as. Save. Notice it's M10 practical example conveyor. Save. Initiate the simulator and turn it on. Otherwise I can't download to. Oh, looky there. It's folded. Well, that's cool. Oh, there we go. A power failure occurs during RMC before changes are being written permanently to the controller. I don't know how I did that. So we'll just say OK. And of course you can't clear it here because we're not online with it. It says the current project content does not match the content in the connected controller. Well that does present a challenge because we would have to go back to the other project if we want to take that route. Instead here's what we're going to do. We're going to download the current project to the controller. What that will do, it will wipe out the fault. The controller is faulted. Continue to download will clear fault information. Clear the fault, change the mode to remote program, and continue to download. Yes. Here we are downloaded and online. And I've moved, unpinned, and moved some of the tabs to the side. This will work temporarily until our logic gets too big. One thing I did want to point out in the global variables, notice that there's a logical value and a physical value, but the physical values all say non-applicable, NA. Well, just give that a second thought and you'll come up with the answer. There is no physical controller, therefore there is no physical values. So when you're working with a simulator, there's no physical values, just the logical value. So here's our logic. We don't have a size fault. Size fault is not on. We don't have any logic yet for the size fault, but that bit when we do write logic for it, this needs to be true in order to get the motor started. So no size fault. The stop button, input zero, of course that always needs to begin in the on state, meaning that the push button is not pushed. Normally closed push button, the stop push button, normally closed, not pushed, has continuity to the screw terminal and sets the memory location that IN00 points to high or one. So this instruction is true. Just keep reminding yourself of that. That's a normally closed push button out there and you're looking at something that looks like a normally open contact. And again, we emphasized that earlier in lab projects that you need to get your thinking straight that these instructions read memory locations, not field devices. They don't read push buttons. They read memory bits that are controlled by the state of the push buttons in the fill wiring connected to the screw terminals going through the opto isolator being collected up and placed in memory. So here's our standard stop start circuit. And we have two things that can stop the motor, a size fault or a stop bit. So at rest, the conditions that are true are the ones that will interrupt it to release it. So if we want to start it, and you need to get in the practice with the simulator as double clicking. So I'm going to double click on one. You didn't even see it come on on the screen. If you want to click slower so you can see input zero one come on the start push button, you can do that. Okay, the motor's running and there's only two things that can stop it. If you push the stop button or if you have a size fault. So we'll do the stop button. That's input zero. I'm going to double click and I did it slow enough so you could see it go blue and then back to red. So see the motor's not running. Double click one and it's running. That's the basic start stop circuit for the motor. But we've already included the size fault to give you a preview of what's to come. So save and disconnect. We're going to add a rung. There's our new rung. And notice this is all seal in logic. We have a seal in bit to bypass the start push button. So you press the start push button when you release it, it remains running. And then we have the stop push button. 
my mistake. Here's our new rung, seal in logic. We have a contact, if you want to call it that, a true on for output one that bypasses input one, the start push button. So after you release the start push button, the motor continues to run. And then for the conditions for the size fault, we have, you have to have one PE and two PE on, meaning block, and the motor running that turns on the size fault. And then we have a seal in bit size fault that bypasses those conditions because they can change. In other words, someone could come up and uh, a split second later, pull it off. It's too bad. It's faulted. So we want to lock in that fault. Save and download. And here we are with our logic with the new rung added. And notice that we have no size fault, so this is true. Stop put, push button is not pressed, so this instruction is true. So let's start the conveyor. So this would be, this logic is at rest right now. It's at rest, nothing's running. So let's double click input one, that gets the conveyor running. Now, and you can't tell by looking at this that there are any cartons approaching the conveyors, on the conveyors. This is all that the PLC sees is that one PE and two PE, their optical paths are clear right this instant and on each scan. If we block the optical path of one PE as the carton passes through and clears one PE and then blocks two PE, then clears and passes on out of the conveyor. So nothing happened. However, if we go back, another carton comes in and it could even be skewed. You know, I mentioned earlier, if the cart was skewed, you wanted enough space between the optical paths of the photo eyes that it wouldn't allow a skewed carton to block both. I changed my mind. If the carton that is that crooked, we don't want it continuing on down the conveyor. And honestly, it should not be crooked because when it rolled down the gravity conveyor and struck the leading edge of the first conveyor, running or not, it should have squared it up. We'll just say that a skewed small carton or a rogue carton, a larger one, could cause this condition. So we're going to turn on input two, and then if the carton keeps moving when it hits input three, the instant it does, it turns on this bit, size fault. This goes false, and the motor shuts off. In other words, you de-energize the motor, and the belt conveyor halts right in position. Now conveyors do have a little coast depending on the inertia of the belt and the rollers and the objects on the belt. So if you have all the stuff moving, then all of a sudden you turn the motor off. If you're not using a brake to stop it in place, which I don't think that's necessary, I think you can adjust your photo eyes and speed so you don't coast out of photo eye one. And even if you did, so what? Let's do that. Let's say that the carton blocked both photo eyes, size fault, false, turned off that bit, and that bit in turn turned off the motor that runs that conveyor. And when it did, it coasted out of photo eye one. So now you've got this. Well, the, because we sealed in the size fault, we know they were both blocked. That's the only way it can happen is that both one and two PE have to be blocked simultaneously with the motor running to cause a size fault. So even though the operator walks up and it's not blocking photo I1, we still captured the moment. So even with a, a little coast, you know, if you're using VFDs, they have coast. Uh, you get With a variable frequency drive, you get some other options that you could get it to stop quicker if you wanted to with decel. But let's stay away from that. So there you go. That's how it works. If the operator pulled out the carton, then this would all be false. And so if you reset it, double click on zero. See, we lost the size fault. Let's start it back up. Okay, we're running. Now let's do that again. Only this time, we're going to leave both of them blocked when we stop the conveyor. So the conveyor stop. If the operator decides to reset it without removing the carton, double click on zero. Okay, it cleared, but watch what happens when you start it. It faults immediately. As a matter of fact, the conveyor is not going to move because you're talking about about 300 microseconds. 
between when you press the stop button and or when you release the stop button because when you press the stop button everything's false you release it then those instructions labeled IN00 stop push button they go true but on the very same scan or the next scan if you flip the location of these rungs you're going to hit a size fault and you're going to turn off output 01 so output 01 might stay on for something under a millisecond a thousandth of a second i'll guarantee you the pull-in time of the contactor or the starter for that motor is multiple milliseconds we had a few questions in the manual try starting the conveyor with the fault in an active state will it run no why can't the motor run with the fault sealed in because the true if off output zero zero is false that was the true if off instruction in the first rung there it's false there's no way to turn that motor on okay then we had you save and disconnect and then i actually had you resave it with a different name so let's save this and go offline i saved it with a new name just like i told you to do this discussion is rendering a little longer than expected m9 the template was too short to make it a separate video discussion and throwing 9 and 10 together is making it lengthy so we're in the middle and we just completed looking at the ceiling logic and now we're going to go to set reset logic so this would be a good spot for you to take a break make a note in the timeline where you're at so you can easily get back here and continue now we're going to edit the logic what we did here and what I told you to do in the lab was to add these two rungs without deleting this rung. This rung uses sealing logic, but notice the conditions for triggering a size fault are the same. Photo eyes one and two have to be blocked simultaneously with motor one running. So one PE block, two PE blocked, and motor one running. Same here, and it turns on the size fault bit. And then the same condition to reset it. So if we press the stop push button, this goes false and this goes true and it resets that bit. So the logical functionality of rung two and then three and four together combination are equivalent. And you could download this and run this. There's no conflict between rung two and then the combination of rungs three and four you're still going to end up with the same condition. I wouldn't do that, but I left in rung two just to show you the comparison. And the discussion that we had in the manual was the first thing to consider is that a direct coil instruction has a true execution and a false execution, whereas the set coil has a true execution and no false execution, as does the reset coil instruction. And this is the understanding of the difference between direct indirect instructions and set reset instructions. Is one has a true and a false execution that you're looking at. If rung two is true, output zero is on. And if the rung goes false, output zero is off. In rung two, right here, this one, right here. If this is true, right here, the rung true end of this instruction then output zero is on. If it's false, then it, it turns it off. Down here in rung three, if this is true, it turns on output zero. If it's false, it's silent. It does nothing. There's no action. In this rung, if it's true, it, it resets this bit in memory to zero. And if it's false, it does nothing. And that's why you can have multiple set instructions addressing the same memory location because there there's no conflict you, if you have a hundred rungs that set output zero zero on then any one of them can set it on and the rest of them that aren't true they they don't affect it because they have no execution they're silent so you could have a single fault bit for the whole system and have 50 different rungs each with different conditions that can turn on that fault bit but you're probably only going to have one rung that turns off the fault. Actually, you could have more than one. But you see the point. There's no conflict between multiple set and resets like there is between having two direct coils addressing the same bit memory. The last one that gets read overwrites whatever the first one did. Last man wins. 
Now, in the manual, uh, I said delete rung to save your project, download and test it, start the conveyor. Now, you could delete it online. Okay, we're offline right now. Okay, and I show the online immediately. I don't show an offline image. So it doesn't matter how you get there. I'm going to delete this rung because it is a duplicate logically of these two. Now I'm going to save. And one more thing I want to point out. This is still seal in logic. We could go back and change this as well. But keep in mind, seal in logic is the most effective programming. A little harder to write, but much easier to troubleshoot and operate. I only use set reset in a situation where I want to hold on to something. Let's say that there's a size fault and somebody uh, kills the breaker or turns off the control panel. When it comes back up, that size fault is still going to be there. If I was using seal in logic, it would drop out all the OTEs or direct coils and it would be gone. So that's the only time that I really use set reset is if I want to maintain it through a mode change or a power cycle. Save and download. Here we are with our edited logic and I see that one and two PE are blocked. Well, that's cool. That's how we left it, right? Before we downloaded, it was in that state. We had inputs two and three on. And if this is going to be a true simulation, the state on the screw terminals would not have changed when we did a download. Even though you go into the program mode, that doesn't change the voltage level on these screw terminals on the inputs. They would stay the same. So this is a good simulation. It's not dropping those out. Now, if we start, we'll go ahead and start. We'll double click on one and you see that you instantly get a size fault. Now notice that this rung is not true. In the previous code, the rung stayed true because we sealed it in. But you see, this is still on. The color of these type instructions, all the instructions you find over here, the color of them denotes the state of the memory location, on or off, one or zero, high or low. Another thing to point out is the difference in the color of the text here on this and this. So this instruction, true if off, is false because that's on. But notice that the text denotes the state of that bit in memory. So this is an add a little bonus with CCW that you didn't get necessarily with other programming platforms. So the color of the text always tells you the on or off nature. Now this rung is false, so this red doesn't mean true. This red just means on, on. And these both address the same memory location, so both of these say out zero zero is on. Now, we started this up, at least we tried to, with a fault. So I'm going to clear the photo eyes and I'm going to double click zero. That's pressing the stop button to reset the fault. Okay, so that happened right here. If I turn off zero, see, this goes true and it resets. But you want to leave it in the on state because this is your, this is your normally closed stop push button connected up to input zero. So now if we go through the process here, we can't block the photo eye without the conveyor running. We can here. Now if someone can put their hand in front of the photo eye. However, if we're running cartons, we're going to double click one. That starts the conveyor and then we're going to see something pop into photo I1. If it's a regular size carton, the correct one, photo I1 will lose that obstacle before photo I2 picks it up. And then if the motor keeps on running, then it clears photo I2 and out it goes onto the next conveyor. Let's do that. Let's do that again. Only this time we're going to block two. And let's say the carton is skewed. You know, it's turned crooked. So it's 1.414 times the one dimension square root of two. And then we block three and we get a size fault. This is really simple. This is really cool. As a matter of fact, uh, the first dozen lab projects, and remember, even though this is M10, we've already done at least a dozen lab projects because, because some of them, like M6, had four or five chunks to it. This is the first lab project that's really fun, in my estimation. This is where your ability to visualize a conveyor from the image that we showed you in the manual. And if you don't have the manual, you're only going to learn so much. You're really at a serious disadvantage if you're watching these videos, you don't have the manual to do the actual lab projects with. Again, the operator comes over. He, she could just push the carton forward out of one PE and then reset it 
and clear the fault. And it would start up again with the rogue carton in there. You can't just keep adding stuff to make this idiot proof. Add some logic that won't allow you to reset unless both photo eyes are clear. Now I know that's not in the manual, but as long as we're exploring this, let's check that out. How do we do that? We had just enough of this window collapsed here that we couldn't see the run mode change. So I'm going to click on run mode change that puts the program in the edit mode. Now this program's still running. Okay, you're not shutting down the program. See, you're still in the run mode. Look down here. And if I, uh, let's see if we're actually running. Nope, we're not running. So let's start it. See the conveyor's running and then let's block two and three. See, we got a fault, right? So we clear two and three, double click zero and we're reset. So the, the code is still running in the background. I mean, the simulator is running or if you were hooked up to a real Micro 800, it's still running. It's still running that program. So what you're looking at is a copy of the program. You're going to edit a graphical representation of what's in the controller. You're going to edit it. And then when you accept your changes and everything, after you test them, it's going to replace the program that's running in the controller with the one that you just accepted, the one that you're editing right now. So our whole reason for going aside here on this rabbit trail was to say that we don't want them to be able to reset it in less 1PE, 2PE. You always are taking a chance when you do this live in front of a, a group of students if you go off with some brilliant idea. So let's save this and I'm going to save it. Oh, I can't do that while I'm in the run mode change. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to test the changes. Okay, so it's kind of reassembling and it's basically what it's doing. You got two copies of the program, if you want to say that, in your controller, more or less. And it just switched from the other one to this one. So you can test it. So let's let's cause this problem. So let's go down here and start the conveyor. It's running. Let's block photo I1 and photo I2. So we get our fault, right? Now let's clear just one and double click zero. See, it didn't clear because it requires that both photo eyes be clear in order to reset it. So this is an improvement. And this would come about in a real factory because your boss or you attended a production meeting and somebody complained about, well, this happened and the, can, the carton was still in there and they didn't notice it. It was still blocking one photo eye, uh, but they didn't really pull it all the way out. They just pushed it forward to clear it. They weren't thinking. And now we got this rogue carton that's too big. And if you know anything about palletizers or unitizers, these uh, production cartons go on a, a trunk conveyor and then they go off onto a spur until they have a unit load. That's a pallet load. Then they go off into the unitizer and the unitizer is set up to layer and stack cartons. But if you got one that's the wrong size, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to jam up that unitizer. So this came out in the production meeting. And so the supervisor or you went back and looked at this and says, well, how can we prevent this? Well, you can't prevent it 100%, but you can see this is a definite improvement. So we had you simulate a bunch of things. Let's clear three and double click zero. So we reset the logic. We had some questions in the manual at this point. Did the conveyor stop running, leaving the longer cart where it was detected? Yes. Is rung number one still true? No. Is output zero on or off? It's off. The motor stopped. Is rung number two still true? Well, that depends, but no, because the motor's not running. Therefore, the rung's going to go false. But because this is a set and not a direct coil, it turned on that bit. And when the rung went false, it didn't turn it back off. So rung number one was not still true and output one was off. Rung number two, is it still true? No. And now if I still had the cartons blocked here, let me put those back in. If these were still blocked, it would still be false. The run would still be false. Get the running again, block two and three and get it to this condition. So we can answer the questions. 
Is rung two still true? No, because motor one is stopped. Is output zero on or off? It's on, so you still have the fault. Do you see the difference in the two instruction types? That is between direct coil and using set reset. Now the idea that you answered yes there <laughs> is for your own edification. They explain direct coil has a true to false execution where the set and the reset coils only have a true execution. Try resetting the fault without clearing the two photo eyes. Does it work? Yes, it'll clear. The fault will clear. So double click stop and you see, oh no it doesn't. In the manual the answer would be yes. But what we did was we added this logic so it wouldn't clear. So this is the problem of going aside on a rabbit trail when you're doing these lectures, but I think you fully get the idea here. If we had left these two instructions out of this rung, then try resetting the fault without clearing the two photo eyes. Does it work? You would have said yes. Clear the two photo eyes by flipping input two and three off and try resetting the fault again by pressing the stop push button. Does it work? Yes, it does. So we had a, a variation here that improved the situation where it doesn't reset unless you've cleared the two photo eyes. I like that much better. So in the logic we did have before without the addition of these two true if off anded photo eye one and two, you could clear the fault without clearing the photo eyes, but it will immediately fault on start. And I guess you could argue that doing it this way is it saves time and production time because the operator doesn't hit the stop button, think it's reset, and then hit the start button, and it doesn't run, and they're standing there thinking, okay, now what's going on? Now they're standing there, they don't know what's going on, they call maintenance, the maintenance guy gets there and he looks at it and says, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, this is with the previous logic, not this logic. And actually, even with this logic, if they don't know they have to clear that carton, then, they don't, they're never going to get it running again. Okay, let's take a look at uh, something else. To do that, I'm going to save. Uh, I'm in the still in the run mode change, so I have to accept these changes. Okay, so the way I left it, and you'll notice up here from our previous lab project that this changed color, and if we click on it again, it basically goes back to the other program. But I'm just going to say yes to accept. Or I'm going to click on the accept. And now we're on a run out of run mode change. Now I can save it and disconnect. This is the image in your manual. And what we've done here is we've tried to kind of match up your inputs and outputs. So we've got field wiring for both inputs and outputs, and then we've got logic. So first let's answer the questions to make sure that we've covered that, those bases. Are there any completed circuits in the field wiring? Yes. Which ones? Well, the stop push button. The stop push button is the only field wiring that has a complete circuit and is lighting up the LED in that opto isolator and turning on its bit in memory to the on. Now, I don't have them lined up with the exact input. So input zero is the stop push button. You just ignore the fact that the stop push button should be down at the bottom where 2PE is instead of up at the top. I wasn't going to redraw this. So just in your mind, pretend that the stop push button input zero is connected to the op opto isolator that is addressing bit zero of the inputs and vice versa for all the rest of them. So the dashed lines are representations, not warranty. They don't warranty that's how it is in the actual processor and controller. It's just a representation. Enough said on that. Are there any bits in the on state in the memory locations connected to devices in the field wiring? Yes, which one? The stop push button. Now relate the state of the bits in memory with the action of depressing one of the push buttons. Depressing the start push button does what to its bit in memory? Turns it on. Depressing the stop push button does what to its bit in memory? Turns it off. And that right there is a real good thing for you to focus in on between the stop push button and the start push button. One's normally closed, one's normally open, which means what you see in memory on off is gonna be exactly the opposite between the stop and the start when you're representing pushed or not pushed, depressed or released. Trace the electrical path action from the input fill devices to the output fill devices. In other words, from anything over here in the fill wiring for inputs, all the way through the whole system over to 
anything connected to the field wiring and the outputs, the conveyor motor or the fault light. Is it continuous? No, there's no electrical path from one end to the other. If there is a break or a gap, what is it? Well, there's a number of them. First, you got the opto isolator, which uses light to turn a phototransistor on or off to represent the state of the input. Then the state of that transistor in the opto isolator goes to a memory location when the processor collects the I.O. Then when you read the logic, the logic may read the stop push button or the start push button or photo eyes and through the logic, the logic turns on a bit and the output bits there, 0 through 15. Now notice that uh, I do have the conveyor and the size fault lined up with the right bits. So you see there's, there's no connection between the field wiring on the inputs and the field wiring on the outputs. Zero. As a matter of fact, there are two air spaces between those electrical circuits. The two opto isolators. Opto isolator on the input, opto isolator on the output. And then in between that, you've got code or logic that is reading the state of memory bits and writing to the state of memory bits. So this is the big picture, folks. Okay. Uh, that wraps up that particular lab project, but we're not done with this project, okay? We're going to continue building on this conveyor system. What we did was laid the rudimentary control for these three conveyors, a system control, then an individual conveyor control. We also have a rogue carton detection. Now that detection is only as good as the spacing that you put on those two photo eyes. So the right size carton, even if it's a little crooked, should not be able to block both photo eyes simultaneously. But a rogue carton, one that's too big. Now, is there a chance that there's also one that's too small? That may be true. And if you, when you get all done with this project, towards the end of the manual, the end of the course, if you want to go back and think if you can think of a way to detect a carton that's too short. Now there is obviously a way to do that. That would require another photo eye because if the carton, the right size carton has to fit between the two photo eyes, then you would have to have a third photo eye between those two that says if the um, carton clears the first one but not the second one but it has not hit the third one then it's too short I'm, that's just a hint so don't do that right now don't get distracted just stick to what you're doing sufficient to the day is the evil thereof in other words you got enough to deal with today just deal with it and don't get distracted. I get too easily distracted. Don't be like me. I go off doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So anyway, we'll see you for the next project.